Hi, my name is Tour Somerville. I'm a professor at the Sauter School of Business at UBC. And let's see if we can get that turning out there. Um, hi, my name is Tour Somerville. I'm a professor at the Sauter School of Business at UBC. And Duncan has asked me to give a few words uh, on housing supply in Canada. Um, and hopefully I can do that relatively quickly. I don't think I have anything new or particularly unique to say. The sort of issues that we face are uh, those um, similar to places like Australia, uh, California, um, although like Australia and like parts of the United States, there's a large variation across the country, and we'll get to that um, partway through this presentation. Um, uh, as requested, I'm going to sort of separate this into two pieces, one a construction sector side uh, and the other a uh, uh, land supply side. So sort of differentiate between um, those two aspects and sort of talk about how that um, plays out. Um, you know, at the outset, I think it's important to recognize, and this is something that I, I mentioned um, in the previous session, uh, and certainly will be no surprise or nothing uh, unique to uh, those people who come from other uh, countries where there are very sort of large differences across regions or cities, um, that um, saying Canada and a Canadian housing market uh, beyond capital markets really doesn't mean very much. Uh, because the markets are, are particularly local, and I think on the supply side, even more so. Uh, so you know, in, in an Australian context, uh, you know, just as Sydney and Melbourne are the sort of primary destinations for capital inflow for immigration, uh, Vancouver and Toronto play the same role here um, and you know, face the similar kinds of housing market issues that you see in those cities and in London as well. Um, and then there are a large number of other cities um, that um, you know, don't have the same kinds of constraints from a land use side, uh, don't have the same kind of growth pressures, um, or have very, very different um, approaches uh, to the role of, of government. So we'll try to sort of cover those differences. You know, roughly speaking, we can think of it as, you know, you've got Vancouver, um, you've got um, Alberta and the prairies, you have uh, Toronto, you have Montreal, and you have Atlantic Canada. Um, not to leave out our nation's capital, Ottawa, but of course, like all capital cities, it's kind of a sort of unique circumstance. And, and um, market conditions um, vary across these, um, these cities and, and the approaches to uh, land use and to regulation vary as well. And hopefully I'll touch on some of that. Um, within the context of the construction sector and pressures that it might have been facing pre-COVID, where things are during COVID and what are the long run issues, um, I think the place that you want to start um, is uh, if we take a sort of the last five, six, seven years um, as a framework, um, one of the challenges in uh, construction markets in Canada has been um, supply of skilled labor. Uh, and the challenge here has come mainly because of the uh, draw that the oil sector in Alberta, uh, particularly the oil sands projects in northern Alberta, have on skilled construction labor. Those are, were, are projects where um, a tremendous amount of industrial infrastructure needs to be built in order to, to process uh, the oil sands and convert the bitumen into something, convert them into bitumen and then and that into something that can be shipped. Uh, and, and used. And so uh, in some national sense, you know, a lot of blue collar labor that might have flowed to other markets um, was drawn to Northern Alberta. You know, you had, you know, people in Atlantic Canada, you know, three time zones away, you know, not necessarily commuting, uh, but uh, doing uh, seasonal shift work essentially uh, in Alberta and then, then flying home. Uh, and thus able to continue to live in areas that had very little employment growth, but earn uh, salaries that were, were extremely high. But that also that then made um, construction market labor markets tight um, elsewhere in in Canada, particularly in Toronto and Vancouver, that were experiencing a lot of immigration uh, inflow and uh, capital inflow that was uh, demanding new you know, new real estate projects, and so. Uh, the construction that you would see, particularly high-rise construction that requires a bit more skilled labor, um, struggling to find the labor for that and, and uh, turning essentially to international markets and temporary worker programs in order to, to, to draw those, those people in. 
So, you know, um, pre-COVID, we, we were really sort of in the labor market shortage situation in construction and rapidly rising construction costs um, with a lot of challenges um, for developers to get crews, to get skilled labor, um, costs uh, rising rather, you know, you know, dramatically, you know, people certainly talking about double digit increases in their construction costs, um, uh, particularly in the period leading up to, to COVID. And this is despite, uh, you know, um, a slowdown in Alberta um, that did not sort of fully address the problem, you know, partly because, you know, there'd been a long period where Canada was not uh, training the next generation of skilled construction labor. And so, um, sort of a real disconnect there. When you sort of look at job sites, you'd see a lot of young folks without, you know, fully developed skills and a lot of older folks, but sort of a missing generation in between them. Um, COVID in terms of the construction sector um, has had a relatively um, small effect, um, mainly because um, there hasn't been a shutdown in that sector. That sector has allowed to been allowed to continue um, during uh, COVID in all the major cities. Um, and sort of that, you know, part contributes to, to the situation where we see um, women um, and young people who, you know, might be disproportionately in the, in the service sectors and um, being hit by this downturn uh, relative to men, in contrast to the more sort of typical downturn where blue collar jobs and construction jobs tended to be the first to disappear. So um, construction has gone on. Um, the challenges there have been in some material supply um, and supply chains. Now, we do a lot of construction out of wood. We have a lot of wood. <laughs> we grow a lot of trees. Uh, and so um, it's more been uh, in the realm of imported specialty uh, products um, because wood and steel has certainly been uh, sufficiently available as, as concrete, but uh, items that need to be imported from the United States um, or from Europe or Asia is where there's been some disruption uh, in, in process. Coming out on the other side, um, you know, I think a lot depends on, on how things proceed. You know, if, if, if we have this sort of long, slow um, recovery, that's gonna end up hitting the construction sector. Uh, and so, you know, short run concerns there um, will probably be mitigated just because of lack of, uh, lack of demand. More generally, you know, there's there there remains the problem of of labor shortages in terms of skilled labor, uh, just because we sort of have moved to a framework of trying to educate lots of young people in university, um, and not done as good a job on skills promotion historically as it might have been at, at one time. Canada's immigration policies tend to to be sort of you're either in the refugee bin, the family reunification bin, or you're an economic immigrant, and the economic immigrants tend to be looking to, to uh, immigrants with high uh, human capital in terms of, of degrees, um, and that tends to mitigate um, a supply of uh, immigrants with um, blue collar skills um, that might be useful in the construction sector. So I think there's still challenges there going, going forward. Um, that um, are part of sort of long-term trends that haven't really been reversed. Um, but the construction sector, I think, would say would be one that you would just say considered to be similar to, to what you'd face in most of the industrialized world, um, where the disconnect with the aging population creates certain uh, challenges around um, having uh, enough of a, of, a, of a labor supply. Although, you know, we have the immigration um, part of it, but unlike the United States, our immigration, you know, weighted to people um, with more uh, college education and um, higher end skills, and and thus not solving the problem the way it might in the United States, where a lot of the immigration uh, occurs at, with skill levels that fit in with the construction industry. Um, so, you know, the other uh, category, obviously, um, is the regulatory framework and the financing side of things, and. Uh, on, on this side, I think I want to sort of think about two, two pieces, sort of one, uh, the role of financing and how that plays out uh, in housing supply, particularly construction finance, uh, and then on the other side, uh, the other piece of it, sort of land use regulation. So, so being able to finance construction and the land use regulation piece. Obviously, these go together. You can't get financing unless you're sort of a certain uh, way through uh, the regulatory uh, process. Um, 
we ended up we've ended up having a sort of uh, conundrum uh, in some of the provinces like British Columbia where um, you have to be able to to show that your project is doable uh, in order to get the regulatory approval in order to market the project you have to be able to construct the project you can't construct the project without the permit you can't uh, uh, get financing without a permit so there's sort of this sort of this little uh, trap um, where for a, a lot of developers sort of have to square the circle. Um, what's emerged is a framework um, where um, developers have six months when they're allowed to pre-sell um, before they've gotten um, all, all permits. Um, that pre-selling then allows them to get permits and get financing, um, but they have a relatively short window. And so um, we have a financing situation that really runs um, for condominiums, um, and, and that's the dominant form of new construction in the largest cities. So when you go to Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, uh, the dominant form of new construction is not single family for reasons we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. So the, the financing situation essentially uh, encourages developers to be very aggressive on pre-selling units um, in order to meet uh, targets set by the lenders. Those, you know, go back to the, to the late 80s and 90s when lenders were burned on speculative construction and we fundamentally see very little uh, pure speculative construction in, in, in major markets in Canada. Instead, developers are expected to pre-sell anywhere from 40 to 80 um, percent of, uh, of the units depending on um, their lenders' perspe perceptions of, of their ability to execute and their credit worthiness. Um, and that has moved us in a direction where um, it's better to do bulk sales to investors um, rather than, than end users for a lot of projects. So that sort of financing framework also, you know, drives form in the sense that lenders are more risk averse and sort of, you, so we, we have this framework where in the largest cities, pre-sales, pre-sales um, uh, that tend to, um, cater to the investment market, and thus the project, the product in the uh, the condos are ones that are going to be more popular um, with with the, uh, the with individual investors who will be buying some number of units. Um, that's sort of on the, the financing side. Uh, rental financing is obviously a little bit different. People aren't pre-leasing uh, rental construction. Um, the challenges for um, rental builders, um, purpose-built rental builders has less been on the financing side and more on the land acquisition side. Um, although uh, in order to, to aid them in this, uh, CMHC uh, started in 2017, uh, it's part of the Federal National Housing Strategy, um, a program to pr provide uh, low cost, long-term construction financing. So construction financing that rolls over into a 10-year total um, uh, term financing uh, for projects that were rental projects where um, uh, about 20% of the units, I believe, um, were to be affordable based on 30% of, of market rents. So, you know, there, there are those kinds of financing, but in general, rental financing is pretty, uh, pretty market driven. Um, one of the issues that's emerged, that has tended to emerge uh, in Toronto and Vancouver um, although not in the last couple of years, but for, for a number of years is we would get condos, we wouldn't get purpose-built rental. Um, many of the condos, perhaps a third in some areas, would be owned by investors who would rent them out. Um, but uh, from a policy standpoint, officials uh, tended to be concerned that that was not a secure long-term rental supply that uh, you know, investors, uh, once they wanted to exit, would sell to an end user who would be an owner-occupier and so it was not secured rental tenure. Um, in the rental sector, there we have fairly strong rent control, um, certainly in the major provinces, BC, um, Ontario, Quebec, uh, Alberta, the other major province, tends to be more free market. Um, and so you see, you see less of it there, but certainly in comparison to the United States, um, much stronger tenant protections. But those tenant protections you know, uh, don't work when the unit is sold and someone wants to occupy it for their own use. And so, um, from the perspective of policymakers, um, or certainly the, plan the, the planners, concern about this disconnect between um, rental supply that um, 
is not what was referred to as secured rental supply, but was operating via condo buildings and investors owning the individual units. You know, so that's kind of one of the frameworks that we have on, on, on the supply side. Until maybe the last four years, five years, when you started to get programs um, that were promoting uh, rental housing through the CMHC financing program, through cities uh, giving uh, density bonusing or uh, reductions from certain charges, um, we would uh, tend to see condos dominate just because um, essentially investors are willing to pay higher, for, people are willing to pay more for a condo uh, than you would get per square foot um, for, for a rental building. And so uh, the condo developments would, would dominate. So, you know, that sort of demand side uh, driver uh, has meant that the supply of purpose-built rental units has been, had, was for many years, was very, very low. Um, and um, it's only recently with the, uh, the changes, particularly in the, this perspective of, of city planning, that you've tended to get more rental housing. One, one um, the development certainly in British Columbia um, has been the sort of interest in rental-only zoning. Uh, so around transit stations, uh, zoning just for, for rental properties. Um, the, the biggest issue uh, on housing supply um, is the land use regulation supply side of things. And, and you can kind of see this if you sort of look uh, across the country. Now, if we take the Albertan cities, um, Edmonton and Calgary, so surrounded by lots of land, they can build in 360 degrees, um, a very business friendly um, uh, provincial and local government environment uh, and so CMHC estimates uh, supply elasticity numbers that are uh, of around a little bit below one uh, for Calgary and about 2.0 for Edmonton. Compare that to Vancouver and Toronto where you have two cities that have both geographic constraints um, in terms of water uh, for both mountains as well and the US border for, for the United States. Um, those two cities also have um, the functional green belts uh, that limit the uh, ability of the city, uh, the built of uh, the urban form to sprawl uh, into to the rural hinterland. Um, and they have uh, local governments that tend to, to be more challenging uh, towards development. And when you look at the, the estimated supply elasticity there that CMHC comes up with, you got 0.25 in Vancouver and about 0.5 um, in Toronto. So, you know, like uh, cities in, 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 in the UK, particularly London, like the Australian cities, um, the housing supply issue here is very much sort of a regulatory framework issue um, where the, the regulatory framework sort of has a number of different pieces to it. You know, one is the have development finance um, everything. Um, so, uh, you know, lots of fees and, and, and charges on developers. Um, um, uh, an interest in um, making sure that some percentage of the increase in land value um, goes to the city when rezoning occurs and doesn't just go to the landowners. And that's very much a BC thing, but you see it sort of in, in Toronto as well. Um, and, you know, the problem there is that uh, since a lot of the development uh, in the biggest cities is not at the fringe, but is redevelopment, uh, in the core, if you're thinking about land assembly challenges, you have to be able to provide premiums uh, to landowners to get them to sell in order to assemble. And so um, you see sort of challenges there with the fee um, environment, particularly on the rezoning side, limiting the ability to, to provide the premiums that you might need um, to get um, landowners to sell. When we had sort of uh, brownfield sites um, or you know, parking lots, this is, wasn't such an issue. But as the developments have started to require the assembly of existing residential uh, developments, um, that challenge for land assembly um, is, is really gotten um, more acute. Both uh, Toronto and, and Vancouver, um, and to a lesser extent Montreal, again, sort of the Albertan cities, Calgary and Edmonton, tend to be sort of very, very free market. Um, but the, the uh, Toronto and Vancouver tend to have very, very active planning departments uh, and tend to run very much on a negotiated approach um, to, to development rather than a sort of clarity of rules and, and, and process. And so there's sort of the upside of this, which is it allows flexibility. Things aren't locked in. The downside is that negotiated process takes a very, very long time. 
Um, and so it's not that things don't get built. So this is sort of not a UK situation where um, nothing is ever, uh, ever built, but it takes a really, really long time and it's very, very expensive. Uh, from a, a, a finance standpoint, there's a lot of money spent in that process that's equity, not debt. Um, and so therefore, when developers have uh, uh, hurdles, um, they're putting a lot of their own money into the projects very, very early. And that makes it sort of challenging on the IRR standpoint. Um, there's certainly sort of awareness around this. I'd say that the sort of, you know, in, in BC, we have a, a left to center um, government that's established uh, an expert panel uh, to provide recommendations for addressing housing supply. Um, the Liberal government through the, the through CMHC um, uh, and the National Housing Strategy um, certainly is focused on, you know, how to, to address supply issues. Um, so I think there's certainly a, an awareness on this, but one of the problems, of course, is that um, land use regulation is a you know has been given by the provinces to, to local governments, and getting local government coordination has been a real challenge. Um, you know, everyone's in favor of the regional targets, but no one wants to actually uh, implement them themselves, and every everyone is uh, very sensitive to to local government to local uh, opposition. Um, councils have a lot of control and discretion on rezoning. Uh, it's not uh, a professionalized process, it's a politicized process. And so ultimately you're looking at, at political solutions there. Um, so, you know, you know, in the Canadian context, housing supply, um, it's not across the country that it's an issue. It's an issue in Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, um, to a somewhat smaller extent in Montreal, but um, but not an issue in Alberta, not an issue in the prairies, not as much an issue in, in Atlantic Canada. But those cities are the you know are some of the biggest cities that are taking you know outside of Alberta taking the largest growth of the immigrant destination cities, um, and so they're cities that have you know built a lot of units, um, but still seem very very challenged uh, in this area. Now it doesn't help that like. You know, Sydney and Melbourne, there's also a, a lot of capital inflow. There's lots of uh, second uh, home purchases. Um, and, you know, both Ontario and British Columbia have enacted policies in, in this area. Um, uh, in, in British Columbia, we have policies around foreign buyers. We have policies around taxation of non-residents. We have policies around ta taxation of, of vacant homes that seem to be having um, some effect, but obviously not dramatically changing anything. So that's a little bit of a background on, on housing supply uh, from a Canadian perspective. I hope that uh, uh, proves useful. And I do hope that someone does a good job um, of editing this. Thank you very much.